Good morning, everyone. We're getting started in just another couple of seconds here. We'll get everyone to have a seat. Hope you're enjoying Cisco Live so far in the first couple hours. Who was here yesterday? Ah, very good. Have you started doing the um, collection of your activities so you can win prizes at the end of the show? Yes, no, no? All right, I'll talk about that in just a second, what, uh, what we need to do for that. Uh, next up here on stage, we have uh, Chavi Nichaven, and she's going to be talking about uh, cloud services. Uh, I guess the benefits of either doing it yourself or going with services. And uh, I think that should be a great, uh, a great session coming up. Just a couple of uh, housekeeping items to begin with, though. Um, after the session, please exit to the front um, of the theater, if that's okay with you, please. Uh, and then I do want to remind you about this um, DevNet Loot Scoot. Uh, all you've got to do is stop by that booth that's right on the other side where it says DevNet Zone, uh, scan the QR code, and it will uh, allow you to collect activity codes during the course of the week that you're here. And for each activity code that you earn, you'll be able to select a prize at the end of, uh, at the, end of the collection period. So please do that. Who here are members of the DevNet program? All right, just a few of you. If you've not joined the DevNet program yet, please, I encourage you to do that. Again, after the session, you just go follow that DevNet Zone sign, and at the other side of it, they'll just help you uh, register to become a member. And with that, Chavi, um, have a good session. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Cisco Live. Welcome to this session on public, private, or hybrid cloud. Which one should I choose? Uh, my name is Chavi. I'm a technical marketing engineer in Cloud Virtualization Group at Cisco Systems. So. Everybody wants to be in the cloud. Is that right? Do you agree with me? Any hands up? Everybody wants to be in the cloud. But the cloud itself is pretty cloudy, so to speak. The, the understanding, the terminology. If you ask customers, what do you want in cloud? Do you want compute, storage? How, do you, how would you get your data in the cloud? And I hope this is never the way to get your data in the cloud. And, uh, Again, is your data secure when it goes to public cloud? I have a, a laptop, I have a server machine in my uh, data center. Is that private cloud? I, do I already have private cloud? What is a hybrid cloud? So those are the things that I want to clarify in this session. And that's the agenda of this session, that I'll go through a little bit of the terminology of cloud, clarify what is public, private, and hybrid cloud. What is IS, SaaS, PaaS? If, you, if you're using cloud, you'll hear those terms all over the place. Then we'll talk about the advantages and disadvantages of public, private, and hybrid cloud. We'll shift gears from there, and we'll talk about Cisco InterCloud Fabric. What, are, what, what does it bring to the table? Where does it help? And what are its services? What's its architecture like? So it's a fairly short session, and that's what we'll cover in this session. Let's get going. Uh, all clouds are data centers which have compute and storage put together by a network. So what makes a data center cloud? What makes a data center cloud is that all these resources are virtualized into this big, giant, shared resource pool, which can be automatically and intelligently orchestrated. So your cloud apps can automatically uh, pick up as many resources as they want, since it's a virtualized resource pool. And uh, you don't have to custom provision boxes whenever you have to deploy apps. So that's why clouds are awesome. They're like uh, cost-effective and efficient data centers. Then comes, you know, so now that we have an understanding of what is cloud, you will hear about the different services models on cloud, which is SaaS, PaaS and IaaS, infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, and software as a service. So we'll talk about that, and then we'll talk about cloud deployment models, that is public cloud, private cloud, and hybrid cloud. So SaaS, PaaS, and IaaS, and all of them are very easy to understand if we look into our traditional IT model, which we are all used to. We are all used to, we are used to maintaining our own data center where we are responsible for the entire stack. We're responsible from getting the servers, racking them, uh, 
power, cooling, um, cabling, networking, putting in servers on top, virtualization, OS, data, application, the entire stack, you are responsible for the stack. So that's traditional IT model. Now, what these services model and cloud mean is that I, want, I don't want to be responsible for the entire stack. I want to offload some part of the stack to the cloud provider. And that's where these services model come into play. Infrastructure as a service is saying that, hey, I want a platform where I can deploy my workloads. I can deploy virtual machines. So cloud provider, you take care of the stack till the virtualization layer. You're responsible for servers, you're responsible for networking, you're, you give me a platform where I can deploy VMs. I'll pick up the OS, I'll be responsible for patching that OS, I'll be responsible for putting metadata, I'll be responsible for running an application, putting my data on it. That's infrastructure as a service. Then if you look at uh, app developers, they're interested in a platform where they can deploy their code test their code, and that's all they want to uh, worry about. They don't want to worry about even that which OS, what patches to deploy on. So they are interested in something called platform as a service, where they are responsible only for the application, that the code that they run, and the data that they put onto it. And the rest is the responsibility of the cloud provider. So that is the service model called platform as a service. Then comes software as a service. I'm an end user. All I want to do is subscribe to a service, like you do with your email. You, you subscribe to it, you put your, this is my ID, you subscribe for it, and you're responsible for putting your data on it, but that's, that's the extent of your responsibility. You're not responsible for maintaining the Gmail servers or you know, uh, what patches come into it, what updates come into it. So you are an end user and you use that service where the entire stack is maintained by the, uh, by the service provider. So that is software as a service. And I like to compare everything with uh, my work or my car. So if you, your own car is like, traditional IT model, your own data center, where you are in control of everything. If you compare uh, IAS, it's like a rental car. You, you're not in control of cleaning the car, you're not in control of servicing the car, so you offload some responsibilities to the rental company saying, I'll rent the car, I'll be responsible for fueling it, but you're responsible for cleaning, servicing whenever I need it. That's infrastructure as a service. Then if you further want to offload responsibilities, uh, you can compare platform as a service with a taxi service. I mean, Uber is quite popular as a taxi service, so uh, it's a taxi service, I'm responsible for only paying you and telling you where from where to where I want to go. And you pick me up and rest is offloaded to you. So that is platform as a service. And then software as a service is like pub using public transport where they have their own schedules, all you do is pay for it and uh, use the service. So far, so good? Okay. So that was SaaS, PaaS, and IAS, and you'll hear about these terms all over the place. And if you uh, look at the uh, cloud pyramid of who will be interested in IAS, who will be interested in SaaS, and who will be interested in PaaS. IAS, as I said, provides you a little bit lower level control. So infrastructure guys, network engineers, they are inf interested in infrastructure as a service. Then comes uh, PaaS, application developers are interested in PaaS, and end users are interested in SaaS. And the, this pyramid completely changes if you look at number of providers. There are lots and lots of applications, software applications out there, lots and lots of SaaS applications. Some PaaS pro uh, cloud platforms and a very few IAS providers. So now that we know what is SaaS, PaaS, IAS, let's look into what is public cloud, private cloud, and hybrid cloud. Public cloud, as the name suggests, uh, the cloud provider makes resources available to general public. You just have to pay a fee for it. It's, it's pretty much for your use. It's an unrestricted use of the resources. Swipe your credit card and you have the resources available for you. That's public cloud. In private cloud, the same resources are available 
they're hosted by an enterprise, on-premise or off-premise, they're maintained by the enterprise, and they're available in a controlled manner to the enterprise users. They're meant to be used for the enterprise. So that's a private cloud. And as the name suggests, hybrid cloud is a hybrid technology between the two, where you're using both. You're using private cloud and public cloud. Either you're using them independently, or you have a way which, is, which can be a proprietary technology or a generic technology to migrate your data and application between private and public. That is hybrid cloud. There, there are certain other community clouds and VPCs, uh, virtual private clouds, which are provided by public cloud providers. But in, in short, I mean, that is the definition of public, private, and hybrid cloud. So, now that we are clear with the definitions, uh, again, let's, let's compare it with our uh, car. My car, I wish I had that car, but uh, my car, yes, private cloud, uh, all the resources are under my control, and I decide what has to be deployed, and uh, uh, I use it's for my use, it's not for anybody else's use, though my husband uses it all the time, but uh, that's a different story. Uh, then uh, public cloud is like public transport. You, there's no shame in using public transport. Uh, it's available, just pay for the fee, and the resources are available. And hybrid cloud is something like a trailer on back of car. You, sometimes you need additional capacity. So what do you de do? You put a trailer on the back of your car, and sometimes in, once in three years I have to move. So I put a trailer on the car, and I get that additional capacity to move my stuff. So, and again, this is just for your, now that we know what is public, private, and hybrid, we know what is SaaS, PaaS, and IS, there are different providers. Uh, Cisco uses a conferencing service called uh, Cisco WebEx uh, that's available as a software as a service. I don't, uh, I just use it. I just subscribe for it and use it as a conferencing uh, service. And it's available as a, in a private cloud, Cisco's private cloud. So that's one example of a SaaS on a private cloud. Then uh, IS on a public cloud is Amazon EC2, Rackspace, Google. And Cisco Intercloud Fabric that we're going to talk about in just a minute uh, fits in a hybrid cloud strategy and in infrastructure as a service model. But hold that thought there. We'll, we'll fill in the gaps. So we, now that we understand what is public, private, and hybrid cloud, which one should I choose? Which one should my enterprise go for? So, that, that becomes clear if we try to look into what are the advantages and disadvantages of using each of them. Why do people go for public providers? One, it's much easier to deploy your apps on public cloud. Why? You don't have to set up your own data center. You don't have to care about the entire stack, as I mentioned. You don't have to care about ordering the servers, maintaining them, powering, cooling, and whatnot. You swipe your credit card, get the compute uh, storage, and deploy your apps. So speed. Second, you can scale out and scale in. Get as much capacity as you want, as little capacity as you want. You have high demand, take more capacity. You have low demand, tone down a little bit. So you can scale out and scale in. And the economics of it, it's, these are shared resources. The economics of it works out, at least in the short term. I won't say it in the long term, because uh, when I talk to customers, and if they're early cloud adopters, they'll say, oh, now. We are, this is, uh, only the early cloud adopters who've been using cloud very extensively, they come back and say, I'm paying a lot of money every month to the public cloud provider. So in the long term, economics is, is a different story for public cloud, but in short term, for sure, public cloud is it's like rental business. You rent money in short terms, it seems to be cheaper. So why do people go for private cloud? It has its own advantages. You are running your own data center. You have full control on what runs on your servers, what applications runs on your server, how much capacity, how much bandwidth you have. You have full security control. You know your data, your applications are running in your data center. You have well-known firewall and networking policies set. So you, you, you're confident about the security of your data, security of all the applications running in your own private cloud. So security is one of the biggest uh, advantages of a private cloud. 
then come uh, potentially higher SLAs that you might hit in your private cloud and data sovereignty. You have full control again on where the data is. So those are some of the advantages, disadvantages of using a public cloud or using a private cloud. And usually what customers do, they, they, they use both in the sense that they'll put um, non-sensitive data like uh, HR, email, CRM tools on public cloud. And highly, they'll put highly sensitive data uh, or um, highly data intensive data like uh, big data applications on private cloud. So that's, that's kind of a hybrid cloud infrastructure. You, in a, and hybrid cloud infrastructure in that way lets you achieve the best of both worlds where you can deploy, it usually starts with this way, you deploy certain apps in your private cloud. Those are constant uh, workloads that you're constantly running. And whenever the demand is high, data usage is high, you want more capacity, you burst onto public cloud. And you get more capacity for that period and then come back. Usually public clouds are pay-as-you-go models, so you rent for that long and then you, come, uh, uh, then you uh, come back whenever the demand is low. So hybrid cloud lets you maintain, lets you achieve that you know, best of both worlds situation. Some of the common use cases of hybrid cloud, as I mentioned, is uh, capacity augmentation. And uh, another kind of capacity augmentation, I was just talking to uh, a customer three weeks back, and he was uh, saying another kind of capacity, capacity augmentation is, uh, he says that his DevOps team takes a couple of, two to three weeks, whenever a new project starts, it takes two to three weeks to assign, them, assign the team servers and capacity and compute and everything. He wants to use those two to three weeks, he wants to use public cloud for those two to three weeks. So he can make his team work on, for the two to three weeks, and once the DevOps team is ready, uh, the ops team is ready to give them uh, the server capacity, he'll bring back, uh, he'll start using the private cloud. So that's another example of capacity augmentation. And another use case is our dev test. You can have dev test on public cloud and then bring back in production your private cloud. You can have shadow IT. when when uh, you can control shadow IT having a hybrid cloud strategy, because if you don't have a hybrid cloud strategy, teams in your enterprise will use public cloud. It's so easy to use. They'll individually use public cloud, and you, the IT would have no control on, on, your, on where your team is using public cloud. So if you have a way for providing your, 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 uh, member, your team members a way to burst onto public cloud, at least that way would be accountable, and you can reduce shadow IT. And disaster recovery is another use case of hybrid cloud. So, as I said, hybrid cloud has many use cases. It, it lets you have this nirvana land where you know you you you're running workloads in private cloud. Whenever you need more capacity, you burst onto public cloud, rent, and then you come back. I wish it was that easy and uh, that simplified view, but it's not really a nirvana land, so to speak. It, and why I say that is it, it's, it's really difficult to have a hybrid cloud infrastructure. Why so? Because you are, you're using, first of all, two different clouds. So you're using some management tools in your private cloud. You have already set some firewalls. You know how to set your networking. Now when you move to public cloud, first, how much control do you have on public cloud? That is defined by the public cloud provider. The management tools, how do you deploy your workloads on public cloud? Completely defined by the public cloud provider's console. So now you have to manage two different tools, one in private cloud, to deploy workloads in private cloud, and the other in pub, uh, public cloud to deploy workloads on public cloud. Completely different tools. Completely different network rules. You have a certain set of IP addresses in your enterprise IP address in your private cloud. You go to public cloud, you have to reconfigure your apps because the networking has completely changed. A completely different set of network IP addresses, completely different ways of creating firewalls, and that, that brings to the point that 
I'm thinking, is my data secure when I move to public cloud? So security is another uh, uh, concern when you move to public cloud. And this is only talking about one public cloud provider. If you compare different public cloud providers, how many of you, uh, any, anybody has used a public cloud provider, is using public cloud provider? Okay, so if you compare two different public cloud providers, you compare AWS, Azure, the terminology is completely different. One calls a virtual networks VNets, one calls it VPCs. One calls uh, Express Route, one calls Direct Connect. Completely different consoles, completely different ways of creating firewalls, completely different way of creating networks and uh, deploying workloads. So if you want to move from one cloud to different public cloud, then God help you. So public cloud, uh, having a hybrid cloud strategy is not that easy. And that's where Cisco Intercloud Fabric helps. Those are the problems that Cisco Intercloud Fabric solves. What is Cisco Intercloud Fabric? It's a software solution that helps you manage a hybrid cloud infrastructure. And when I say it's a software solution, it comes as an OVA file or QCOW file. All it needs is a hypervisor. It runs in your private cloud. All it needs in your private cloud is a hypervisor. It gives you choice of different hypervisors. And what does it enable? It lets you burst onto different public cloud providers. And there are too many things in this statement when I say it lets you burst into different public cloud providers. First, you can burst onto not one, there's no lo vendor lock-in. That's not Hotel California. So you can burst onto different cloud providers. You can, we support AWS, we support Azure, we supported Cisco-supported cloud providers. So using this one single pane of glass, that is the web interface of Cisco Intercloud Fabric, you burst onto different cloud providers. You don't have to go to different cloud providers console. Through this one place, you can see deploy and manage workloads running in different cloud providers. So you get a choice of hypervisor in your private cloud, choice of running, uh, bursting onto different public cloud providers. And it also provides role-based access control in terms of uh, providing different user roles. So you can have an admin, cloud admin, who can define what are the various cloud links or what are the various public providers I can, I'll burst onto. And then a user where the cloud admin defines say, that this user, user of team A, will get access to this public cloud provider. User of team B will get access to that public cloud provider. So it gives you different portals, uh, an admin portal and a user portal. Just a quick look at the architecture. As I said, Intercloud Fabric runs in your private cloud and it gives you different portals and uses an admin. In your private cloud, it's going to talk to the VM manager, which is, if you're running VMware as your private cloud, it's, it's the vCenter. If you're running Hyper-V, it's the SCVMM. If you're running OpenStack, it's the uh, OpenStack controller. So it gives you a choice of the hypervisor, and any of these hypervisors, talk to the VM manager, it'll know what VMs are deployed in your private cloud. And then it creates a secure layer to extension onto the public cloud. Again, it's a layer to extension of your network. So when I said, when you're moving your workloads, you have to reconfigure your apps because the networking has changed. Now we are extending your network onto public cloud. So your IP addresses don't change. And it's a secure encrypted extension onto public cloud. And then it has multiple, supports multiple services. You can deploy uh, a router on public cloud to pro provide inter-VLAN routing. You can deploy a firewall, and that firewall can be managed through one single pane of glass running in your private cloud. So you're running, you're managing the firewall policies through this one place, which are running in your private cloud, and the firewall policies of public cloud through one single portal. Cool, isn't it? 
So I, I have only a couple of minutes left, so I'm going to quickly search over. But those are the core services we support. We support switching, routing on public cloud. We support VM portability. You can manage, you can migrate your workloads from private to public, public to private, all through a click of a button. So all these good stuff, and I, I, I'll be here, or we have multiple uh, places and lectures where you can uh, learn more about those services. Uh, you can manage intercloud fabric through the GUI, or you can have REST APIs. So you can have, if you have your own automation tool, you can include intercloud fabric through the REST APIs as well. So just to finish, uh, and I, I know it was a short session, so I, I just want to highlight the key benefits of Cisco Intercloud Fabric. Choice, choice of hypervisor in your private cloud, choice of public cloud provider, choice of move, keeping your workload in private cloud or moving it to hybrid, or, or moving it to public cloud. We take care of the migration as well. We bring back uh, the workload as well. If you want to bring back a workload from public to private, we support that as well. So. Okay. Consistency, control, and compliance, one single work uh, pain of management, managing your private and public cloud. So, and we have lots and lots of sessions that you can go to, learn more about Cisco Intercloud Fabric. I'll be here if you have any questions. So, feel free to stop by. Thank you. Javi, thank you very much. Thank you. Great job. We have uh, about two minutes for questions as well. Do we have any questions from the audience that Chavi can answer for you? Go ahead. Questions from everyone? We do have one here. Hold on. So the question is, is there any setup on the public cloud side to integrate with the uh, intercloud fabric, right? So. It depends on, uh, for public cloud providers like AWS and Azure, we're using their regular APIs to include, so there's no setup required on that side. Uh, for other Cisco-supported cloud providers, there is a version called InterCloud Fabric for provider that they need to deploy to become a part of Cisco-supported cloud providers ecosystem. Okay, any other quick questions? We got one right in the back, hold on. Um. The question I have is um, from a, uh, a big data perspective, you mentioned that it's better to deploy big data or Hadoop or Spark uh, on your private cloud. Uh, now Azure and AWS, they have offerings that also provide big data services. What was the reasoning behind your st statement that it's better to have a private cloud versus a public cloud for big data? You're right, uh, AWS, Azure, all the public providers are providing uh, services for big data and how to open data intensive services. But ultimately, it comes down to economics. If you're running those workloads, those data intensive workloads, it's a pay as you go model on public cloud. If you're running it constantly with a constant user, your uh, monthly bill goes up. And that was the, that's the main explanation around it. 